Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Josh Jensen. I use they, them pronouns. And I tonight, um, I kind of wanted to touch on a lot of big topics, a lot of um, current topics that have been kind of in the cultural zeitgeist of everybody's minds over the past couple of years, especially on the onslaught of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has caused bunch of talks of renewed um, labor organizational calls um, and that kind of came to a head um, last fall, um, specifically in the context of the film industry. Um, there was a lot of chatter surrounding the IATSE 2021 basic agreement contract negotiations that um, concluded at the end of, in the middle of October um, and have kind of consequently, we've entered a new contract deal. Um, and if any of you who weren't aware of things, um, a lot of people were um, left feeling unfulfilled um, in terms of the amount of momentum that everybody in the film union had at the, uh, be at the very end of the basic agreement contracts, um, specifically from the Instagram handle Ayati Stories. Um, and um, a lot of people were saying that this was kind of a more, um, a, a, the best contract that we essentially had um, in recent years and recent decades. And um, talking with a bunch of people that I have worked with over the past uh, on and off year or so, essentially um, in the New York film community, um, I have kind of, uh, it started to make me think about how things used to be in uh, the film industry and kind of how we have gotten to this point, both in the terms of um, the film union world and also just generally in the broader scheme of context of labor organization in the United States um, over the past century or so. And um, with articles that um, have been brought to me by people in this chat, um, uh, it has um, sparked a, a itch um, to go down a really deep hyperfixation rabbit hole um, is the best way that I can describe it. Um, and wanting to kind of describe um, a brief moment in movie going and movie making history specifically, um, talking about um, the conflict between the CSU Film Union and the IATSE Film Union, which IATSE still is very prominent and is the biggest film union in the entire world as we know. Um, and for people who don't know, CSU stands for the um, Confederation, uh, um, the Conference of Studio Unions, who also, who used to be just as big of a rival to the IATSE Film Union, um, beginning around the 1940s. And I wanted to kind of highlight the, the history of um, the conflict between these two warring film unions and kind of the underlying socio-political uh, context that that existed during the time because I feel like a lot of people including myself felt like we missed out on a moment um, last year in 2021 especially with the conditions that a lot of people have been working under um, working minimum 12 hour days sometimes 14 and that's not even including travel time um, especially with other talks that I've kind of helped facilitate here in Park um, Post um, with Shana. Um, it's even been worse for other people, specifically in the post-production world. Um, so um, with all of that said, and with that huge home blow, I will shut up and I will get to my presentation <laughs> and, um, and kind of just like jump right into it. So um, the state of the film union subtitle unionization is always sexy. It was the working title for this presentation and I felt like it was the right way um, to kind of subtextualize um, this work. So to kind of start off, as I was saying before, striked over. Um, we all know that there was multiple industries in America that faced a new strike um, and renewed calls for unionization. Um, if you didn't know, there was those 10,000 10, John Deere factory workers um, that successfully negotiated for a better contract within those union organized um, workforce. Um, many locations um, in Starbucks across the entire country have started to successfully unionize for the first time 
with um, which is a huge deal because um, Starbucks has historically been known to be a huge anti-union and a union busting company. And also there was the 1400 um, Kellogg's factory workers um, that was um, also um, making the rounds on social media and memes and whatnot um, for telling people to break out um, Kellogg's products and whatnot. And they were also able to settle for a better contract if I remember off of my head. And also, the 60,000 IATSE workers across the US last year. Um, if you didn't, this kind of um, rise with essentially on this renewed call for better working conditions um, also unfortunately came to a head um, with the tragic passing of the um, director of photography, Helena Hutchins. Um, who was killed on the set of the non-union production of Rust starring Alec Baldwin. And um, it kind of um, renewed calls of previous people that we have lost in the film industry to other onset accidents as well, um, limited to not only people like Sarah Jones, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, there, was, um, there was strike rallies all across the country in Los Angeles and New York City. Um, pick, as pictured on the left picture right there, um, that was taken at City Hall Park, where um, I see alumni um, also were speaking um, in terms of that. And so, um, but one thing that I wanted to highlight before that I kind of like get into it is that um, it was the 69th Quadrennial IATSE Convention, where um, Matthew Loeb, the current president of IATSE, was unanimously um, and ran unopposed or AKA by acclamation. Um, this happened in this past July where essentially Loeb um, was touting the idea that the IATSE um, contract um, and unity within the, the, the film union was um, at the most progressive that it's ever been. And I wanted to kind of highlight this um, aspect because um, depending on how much time that I have with this presentation, I wanted to highlight that this has been a very important talking point that IATSE has used historically in their contract negotiations um, coming from like um, past the 1989 contract agreements, even though that um, IATSE has had to make um, severe concessions in terms of working additions and also um, all the benefits that they've been able, they could basically fight for in terms with the AMPTP, um, which is the um, negotiation board of producers that IATSE negotiates with every three year, three or four years in order to get um, the contract settled and for people to basically have all of their wages and health benefits and pension plans laid out for the next three to four years in the future. But then, as we all know, um, there was the with the historic strike authorization, uh, strike authorization vote um, last September with over 90% voter turnout and also a 98% vote of a yes vote for striking. Um, there is this huge pressure essentially that, and there was this thought that there was going to be real change actually going to be changing in Hollywood and the entertainment industry. But then at the very last minute, IATSE membership reached a deal with the AMPTP that averted the strike that a lot of people were ready to strike for and were ready to um, fight for in order to change the systemic and brutally long hours that people in the film industry have been having to deal with for decades. And, um, I bring this chart up here specifically because I wanted to point out that um, that historically um, there was this narrative again with Striketober that there was this huge renewed strike, like this huge renewed like energy of labor unionization in America. But as this graph points out, is that that actually wasn't the case. The amount of strikes um, were basically the same level as it has been essentially since 2010. Um, and 
and I feel like uh, that the, the the call for basically calling last October strike Tober with all of these strikes happening was um, giving people like this false sense of hope that um, things were on the uprise and like there is still the potential to have um, a renewed labor um, energy becoming into an America essentially. I just think that we need to be a little more grounded in reality to accept the hard facts that we are currently faced under in order to not let us have this very passive hope of just like, oh, the people in charge are gonna do the right thing. Um, <laughs> so as I'm gonna talk about later um, of how we've gone into this situation, um, the situation is a little bit more complex and a little bit more um, serious than just having things just magically um, change for the better. Um, and as I was kind of talking about that, um, there is a lot of kind of, and with this kind of disappointment of people not having a, a strike actually happen in the industry, um, there was kind of a, a backlash I kind of would feel to um, that IATSE Stories um, Instagram account where um, it kind of saw people within the own film union kind of like going against each other where it's just like, of uh, we lost a moment um, of a lot of self defeating kind of rhetoric and whatnot um, going around on um, being spread in the comment sections of those posts that it kind of led to the I, um, the original idea of IATSE stories to kind of kind of be um, left in the back dust. And um, they just recently started posting again after taking a four to five month break of kind of reassessing what their game plan for um, trying and bringing attention to the harsh working conditions that we still all face um, in the industry as a collective um, film community. Um, um, lost my train of thought there for a second. I'm just gonna go to the next um, slide. So this brings me into um, the main meat of my presentation. So um, um, this history is very rich. Um, and as the title suggests, there are mobsters, there are communists, and there are movie moguls, along with a bunch of other people, but I've decided to omit them um, because if I were to talk about all of it, I, this presentation would be two hours and nobody wants to hear me ramble on for two hours. Um, but specifically, I'm going to be talking about the conflict against the Conference of um, Studio Unions and the International Alliance of Theater Stage Employees. Um, the War for Warner Brothers, um, or AKA um, the March 1945 strike, and more specifically, the 1946 blackout which inevitably ended progressive trade unionism in Hollywood and effectively progressive trade unionism in America as a whole. A thesis statement. Um, democratic and progressive unions once existed and flourished in Hollywood under the New Deal from the 1930s to the 1940s amid a building labor movement in America, specifically in Southern California, through organized crime sponsored by the studios with the compliance of IATSE leadership at the time, a barrage of biased media coverage of the strike and the use of redlining, CSU was defeated in Hollywood along with democratic labor unions that fought for the working class and moral working conditions of the working class. My main sources um, are listed here. Um, if anybody is interested in this material after this presentation, I have a digital PDF where I can uh, message it to you privately um, and um, you can read it for yourself. It's a very interesting read, highly recommend it. And there's also other um, sources that I listed here, which are web articles, which I can also list in the chat and a type of a bibliography of sorts. Um, the key players, um, the, the CSU, or again, the uh, Conference of Studio Unions was led by um, a painter um, named by Herb Sorrell. Um, he was a very interesting man. Um, <laughs> he um, was known to be um, very hyper-masculine, um, but very passionate about his uh, union force and also fighting for progressive trade unionism. 
Um, Richard Walsh, who used to be the um, IATSE president from 1941 to 1974, he played a very key and instrumental role in uh, the conflict. Um, Pat Casey, who happened to be the studio's chief negotiator. Um, and before Richard Walsh, there was George E. Brown, who was president of 1934 to 1941. Um, William Bioff, who was a uh, Chicago mobster and became um, affiliated with the mob in Chicago and eventually the West Coast. And also Roy Brewer, Brewer who was an IATSE representative, um, specifically dealing with the problem in Hollywood. And also, ironically enough, the last key player also happened to be Ronald Reagan, who little known fact actually was the president of the Screen Actors Guild from 1947 to 1952. And in this time period, he actually used um, his platform in order to kind of test some of his more presidential and political tactics that he would go on to use as the 40th president of the United States. Here's the short, um, shortened history of the CSU IATSE conflict. Um, the picture uh, below on this slide is a um, still from the uh, newspapers of Bloody Friday, or AKA the War on Weather Brothers, which I will talk about later on. Um, I really think that this um, statement right here that was put in the book um, is really kind of encompasses um, the general theme of this talk. And I kind of want to just, uh, read it out loud here for everybody. Um, the studios were the one exhibiting class consciousness, standing shoulder to shoulder to confront a common foe while the unions were busily knifing one another. The conflict in Hollywood illustrated an age old lesson. Class consciousness does exist in abundance in the United States. It is just painfully deficient among the working class. And um, during this time, um, specifically in Hollywood, Hollywood was flourishing. Um, during World War II, um, and especially since the Great Depression right before that, um, there was numerous box office records that were being set and put forth um, from the exhibitors um, who at the time were all virtually integrated, which means that they were able to um, own 100% of the filmmaking process from the, the production to the end to the distribution of it, which means that they reaped 100% of the profits at the box office. And at the time, um, and especially to this day still um, in America, the big banks all had many financial investments in the entertainment industry because they were seen as a no risk investment for bankers. With business booming in the 1930s with the invention of the talkies, audiences couldn't get enough of movies amid the growing star system and class conscious films led by the soon to be Hollywood 10, AKA John Howard Lawson, Abraham Polanski, Dalton Trombo and countless others, um, who ironically, um, who don't know, for anybody who doesn't know who the Hollywood 10, Hollywood 10 were, um, they were um, 10 screenwriters that were scapegoated and um, um, dignified as communist as part of the Red Scare and McCarthyism in US politics in the later 1940s, which is just a couple years after this conflict arose. And to stress the importance of movie making and the why um, redlining and basically um, labeling people as communists in the film industry was such a pivotal and marketable strategy in order to defeat the CSU. Um, I wanna read this quote from Colonel F.L. Heron, who was a uh, banker. Um, Hollywood showed people having fun. They depict freedom, prosperity, happiness, a higher standard of living and clothing, houses, motor cars, in fact, all the components of good living. And the world seeing these um, things quickly responds and demands the same thing. American pictures do far more than sell products than 100,000 salesmen can. And throughout the strike and eventual lockout of the CSU workers, the studios all showed solidarity with one another by hyping pay off their debts to Warner Brothers who have been targeted by Sorrell and the CSU to keep the company afloat if they ever felt the economic pressures by the union, which they ultimately did. And the CSU tried to use this in the papers in order to show their, their they were high in strength and they could come out of this on the end triumphant, but unfortunately we all know that is unfortunately not the case. 
And also this, um, the fall of the CSU signaled a troubling trend in American business that meant a turn away from full-time employment with benefits for workers to a freelance, rugged free market system that we all find ourselves in right now. A huge reason why the CSU fell to the hands of the studios amid other reasons, which we'll discuss later, is that Sorrell and the Communist Party couldn't foresee the sharp right swing that American politics would see at the end of World War II and the rise of anti-communism. And at the time that this conflict was happening, specifically in the 1940s and the early 1950s, the unionization rate in Hollywood was 100%. And as you can tell now, um, and see by the statistics, um, from this article quite on set, um, unionization in the film industry and unionization in general in America has incredibly fallen um, to the point that it is becoming detrimental um, to the fact that labor and people in the working middle class um, cannot collectively bargain with these big top players, specifically the AMPTP and also just um, the studios in general is that they, they don't have any um, pathway in order to make any systemic changes to the working conditions that they have currently right now. Um, explaining the conference of studio unions a little bit more. Um, they were currently, they were founded in 1941 and shortly after a, success, a successful nine week strike of screen cartoons at Disney. Um, it's um, ironically enough, it's very ironic that the CSU was formed after this, considering the fact of how big of a conglomerate Disney is and the fact that they basically own all of Los Angeles. <laughs> um, um, Herb Sorrell um, was a painter, um, shortly became the union's leader and was a very polarizing figure, not only among members of the CSU, but also the communists who played a huge role in um, this conflict and also people within IATSE and also the studios themselves. And one thing that I wanted to um, note is that um, the Conference of Studio Unions tried to become uh, a labor organization for something as the, um, the AFL, um, which stands for the American Federation League, um, which basically um, combines all, is, compiles all these smaller unions and basically um, is able to bargain um, for contracts with um, employers in order to basically get them to get the rights and the benefits and the proper compensation that they rightfully deserve. Um, the Conference of Studio Union of Unions composed mostly of carpenters, painters, and cartoonists, um, which uh, there's a huge emphasis on the carpenters because they became a huge part of the conflict um, between uh, IATSE and the CSU. And they also, the one thing that did set them apart from IATSE was something that they had called local autonomy, which meant that they could democratically call a strike whenever they wanted without the president of the union needing to approve said strike. Um, this was seen as the union's biggest um, um, advantage um, over IATSE, which um, people in the CSU labeled um, IATSE more as an industrial union, which means that uh, it's more kind of um, centralized and it's harder for um, independent unions under the umbrella of IATSE in order to um, voice dissent and also provide um, action in terms of um, having a say in what union leadership can do in terms of fighting for um, the contract negotiations every time that that happens. Um, and with this, um, it kind of gets into a little bit of a tricky spot. This is a very um, vital, vital um, piece of information um, to know before going into the conflict. Um, the mobster takeover of the Chicago branch specifically um, I at the local two, which composed of stage hands, um, was um, had somebody in their this is called George E. Brown, who started off as a business manager um, in Chicago um, at the time, as along with any kind of booming industrial um, city at the time in America, um, there was conflicts afoot um, in terms of rising labor um, urges, specifically in 1937. Um, which was a huge and monumental year for um, labor 
organization in America in general. Um, the mobsters essentially um, saw this as an opportunity in order to provide economic control and have a grip on the world economy, um, essentially. Um, and George E. Brown meets this man named William Bioff. And um, they form this plan and this extortion racket where they basically approached theater and nightclub owners um, where IATSE members were employed at the time. And in order to provide um, tranquility and peace between the employers and the employees, um, Bioff and Brown, um, in exchange for money that they um, extorted out of the theater and nightclub owners, in exchange for the money that they were to pay them, uh, they guaranteed the theater and nightclub owners the fact that there would be no labor disputes and the fact that there would be absolutely um, no strikes and stoppages in work. Um, and then eventually, um, bigger Chicago mobster Frank Nito gets a hold of this information and then he wants a piece of the pie. And then he basically comes up to the two of them and offers them two thirds of the profits that Frank Nito and his um, gang of mobsters were making in Chicago in exchange for Brown and Bioff in order to infiltrate um, the West Coast uh, IATSE chapters, which were the headquarters at the time, in order to have complete control over the entertainment world, which as I previously stated, was incredibly influential in terms of having control of the public discourse, the ideology of an entire country, which would come into very high effect after the end of World War II with the rise of the Soviet Union and the threats of communism overtaking um, American democracy, which um, is unfortunately still very much a part of the political discourse on the international stage. Um, and, um, and, then, um, and also this, with the IA constitution that stated the international president must sanction all strikes, a no strike clause and having the international president in their pocket, the, po the mob was poised to make their move to Hollywood. Brown and Bioff contacted the heads of all the motion picture producing companies. In exchange for money, Brown and Bioff were to set it to that the wages of the various locals be kept at a comparatively low level and the whole industry was to be kept on a stable and reasonable plan of operation that would be profitable and advantage to the movie executives. This turned out to be a most profitable arrangement for Brown, Bioff and the Chicago mob until May 24th, 1941, where Brown and Bioff were indicted on federal racketeering charges in New York where many of the moving locals maintain their business offices, the two were found guilty on October 30th. Bioff was eventually sentenced to 10 years in prison and Brown was sentenced to another eight. And then uh, with their president and with this controversy at the very front of the newspapers, Richard Walsh, who was also the vice president of Robert Brown at IATSE during the time is elected president of IATSE in 1941, the same year that the CSU was formed. Um, but this does not stop the mob involvement and also the collaboration of IATSE and the studios begins to go full throttle with the promise that IATSE would keep their workers' wages comparatively low in order to make the profits of movie executives at the highest possible rate that it can be. And one thing um, that I need to explain before I go on is talking about something about jurisdictional disputes. And um, jurisdictional disputes essentially is um, something that was very common at the time actually um, with a bunch of unions and whatnot. Um, basically um, quarreling over which job had which responsibilities in um, which industry. And at the time, since the unionization rate of Hollywood was at a 100%, there was a ton of jurisdic jurisdictional disputes that were occurring at this time. And um, 
offices like the AFL-CIO um, were constantly flooded with these disputes. And um, it was very um, hindering to the productivity of the workplace. Um, because with, um, for example, um, there was um, an internal dispute within the IATSE Local 44 during this time where um, property makers and property men were complaining about whether or not to place a rattan box or baskets in a scene. Um, it could be it could be huge um, disputes in terms of which role gets put suspicion, and it can also be very nitpicky. And um, it was very um, uh, the author of the book um, describes the culture at the time as very um, as bickery. And all the unions essentially wanted to uh, have as much control as possible in their own departments. So it was very common for jurisdictional disputes to come in and stop days of work. Um, and there's multiple other examples of that in the novel as well. Um, overlap and interdependence created many problems. Um, grips often used tools employed by carpenters, electricians did lighting work claimed by prop men. Um, and then prop men made metal parts, um, which it was a job claimed by the machinists. And this just goes on and on and on. Um, through management often, though management often used the tried and true tactic of divide and conquer to worsen, if not foment conflict with, within and among locals, the studios increasingly viewed jurisdictional warfare as draining. While making the film after the war, Columbia directed local, um, to build a fuselage onto a large airplane. The union wanted to paste or glue unbleached muslin over the entire surface of the plane, but due to jurisdictional tensions between the locals and another local, the studio was at a loss. If glue was required, grips would claim jurisdiction. If wallpaper paste were involved, the painters would claim jurisdiction. To avoid arguments of possible work stoppage, the studio accepted a less, less satisfactory finish in order to keep peace. Big reason why um, the studios wanted to stop these jurisdictional disputes is because um, it would basically get in the way of um, making the highest quality um, motion picture and also getting it done as quickly as possible as to not pay the workforce any more longer wages. So what did set the March 1925 strike in motion? Um, it all started um, with a dispute over who controlled the society of motion pictures um, the Society of Motion Picture Interior Decorators, or what we call them today as set decorators. Um, the CSU um, hearing after that, um, the studios did not acknowledge their 1942 contract um, among the SMPID. The CSU allows them to join the ranks and vows to have their contract be honored, and that would eventually become Local 1421. Um, however, IATSE files a dispute that 10% of the workforce in the SMPID belongs to the Local 44, um, which is essentially um, set decorators in IATSE as well. Um, now, it's no, at this point, it should be known that IATSE and the studios were collaborating at this point, and IATSE was um, making themselves to be known allies with the studios and knowing what they, um, the mob had promised um, the studios at the beginning in order to keep um, wages low um, compared to other industries. Um, the studios were very keen and worried about the rise of the CSU in Hollywood because in, other future in the one future contract that the CSU was able to see, um, they made a lot of um, concessions, actually, the studios made a lot of concessions actually with the CSU and proved to be um, not the most cost effective um, in terms of how strong their um, labor organization um, was. So since the both, union, both unions claimed the SMP ID, um, the studios made them petition the National Labor Relations Board in order to settle this, this, this dispute knowing that the other jurisdictional disputes could be very annoying and very pesky to the studio heads. Um, in February 1945, an arbitrator is um, applied to the case 
and they ruled that the producers um, should recognize um, the local 1421's claims. Um, but um, the, refuser, the producers refused this, claiming that the um, hands were still tied between the CSU and IATSE. Um, and then in order to squall this, IATSE um, and CSU representatives meet in a now infamous meeting um, that was, that was um, uh, moderated by Pat Casey, who was the leading Hollywood union negotiator. Um, Richard Wall, w William Hutchardson um, was essentially claiming that um, carpenters should have full jurisdiction over anything um, that had wood related to it. And this even went down to as nitpicky as um, having uh, microphones that had um, wood wooden poles attached to it. Richard Walsh, um, seeing that these demands were insane, um, refused and the entire meeting collapsed and um, started to go by the wayside. Um, and the big reason why carpenters um, turned out to be such a huge um, and important factor in these um, negotiations is that the carpenters are essentially the ones responsible um, for creating the sets and without any new sets on um, the actors don't have anything to act in because at this time everything was still shot on sound stages and location shooting really wasn't um, a, a thing and there wasn't really any precedent for it. For their part, the carpenters and um, of which they were a part of had good reason to believe that Walsh was working covertly with the producers to uh, squash the CSU. Walsh had served during the Biaf Brown regime and still viewed him as their puppet. As Sorrell puts it at the Screen Actors Guild meeting, uh, Walsh was vice president under Brown. If he was a good vice president, he knew what he was going on. And if he wasn't a good vice president, he wouldn't have gone to be president. Walsh, a former stage electrician from Brooklyn, initially defended Biaf and Brown when they came under attack, which only served to feel suspicion of the latest leader. And then after this, um, with the carpenters essentially um, out of luck and without any jurisdictional, um, the CSU went on strike as the studios and IATSEs continued trying to produce movies. The later two recognized that if they could hold off, they could divide the industry between themselves. Both would be rid of a pesky ideological foe, both would be spared certain jurisdictional disputes, and the two had an objective reason to include against um, the CSU. And according to Zach Cobb, the Carpenter's attorney, they did precisely that. And afterward, Walf, Walsh confessed unashamedly that he had collaborated with the Muggles to break the strike. On March 12th, the strike begins and approximately 10,500 CSU workers go on the strike. Um, this basically is uh, makes headlines across the country, um, knowing that um, a larger ideological battle will be later pursued in later year in 1946, um, after World War II is finished and um, the studios and management um, teams across all industries try to um, convert ways in order to break down labor unionization um, in order for the means of productivity. Um, multiple projects um, were shut down because of this and um, many stars like Audrey Hepburn um, refused to cross the CSU picket lines for any studio works um, in addition to many IATSE members actually. Um, this strike would last until October 1945 Seven months of no work in the film industry and leaving their craftspeople out of practice of their trade, which would, is going to come later in handy when the 1946 lockout in September comes into full force. Um, there we go. Um, so, how did the CSU plan on winning this strike and um, making it effective, essentially? Um, they picketed movie theaters and movie studios in New York and Los Angeles. Um, they even had documents called the Ten Commandments of the Pickets. Um, they tried to influence as many newspapers as possible, claiming that um, the studios haven't able, been able to make any movies, um, and they were trying to build morale up within their own base. Um, they were um, at the movie theater specifically, actually, before I go on, um, they used such tactics as um, literally spoiling the ending of the movie for people, um, giving them an incentive to not actually um, pay any movie tickets um, and give, giving money therefore to the studios. 
Um, and then there is also many picket lines um, at the studios themselves, um, which um, would later come to a bloody conflict um, in October later of 1945, which I'm gonna talk about later. And then um, the CSU also um, tossed around um, evoking monetary penalties on their members who didn't um, join the picket line enough, um, which turned out to be not the best solution, um, as you'll see later. Um, and the strategies used by ATSI were, as I've been saying, um, they've collabor they collaborated with the studios in order to wipe out um, the CSU. Um, and then they also used the press and public opinion to insinuate that Soro was a member of the Communist Party um, and the CSU was later nicknamed to be the Red CSU. Um, and the one thing that was very um, different from the CSU than IATSE is that, um, is that IATSE was very good at um, putting down any um, um, differing opinions within IATSE um, in order to have a cohesive message. Um, there would be locals later down the road that would try to side with CSU, um, but IATSE and their um, leadership at the time um, would use the police force and also the organized crime world in order to suppress any dissenting opinions of the IATSE leadership in order to um, gain full control of the workforce in the film industry. And then on top of this, um, many people in IATSE were scabbing and crossing the picket lines and working on studio um, feature films and other um, independent movies as well during this time. Which brings us um, to the war for Warner Brothers. Um, it, this was a, um, a combination of um, CSU picket lines being um, set up across uh, the Warner Brothers lot in Los Angeles. Um, and this was nicknamed Bloody Fade for many reasons um, as um, these next photos um, suggest. Um, as Sora would call it, um, first they drove through the picket lines at a high rate of speed, several cars, I think, and took four people to the hospital. Now, I wasn't there at the time that happened, he reminded, but he did recall when the fire hose was dragged out. They turned it on the people's feet and just swept them right out from under. They threw tear gas bombs. There were women knocked out and it was a slaughter. Um, at 4 a.m., um, CSU picketers, um, totaling about like 400 people, um, were uh, forcing people not to, they were keeping people out of the gates essentially. And then when IATSE scabbers tried to get in, um, IATSE members um, brought weapons such as um, lead pipes, um, baseball bats, and um, other weapons in order to try to fight their way in order to get to work that day. But the IATSE picketers um, fought back and um, this went on for hours and hours and hours until the press, obviously hearing wind of this, um, were able to capture pictures like these. And um, it was very, very violent and very graphic. Um, it all seemed very rugged to Joe Tui of the Teamsters. He realized that he was prepared to go, um, he realized that, um, the CSU was prepared to put up a fight. It was not just goons of police, but the, um, the union itself, which masked all their strength and broke the picket line and got their people through, but only after they were stoned and clubbed. Many of the men were badly cut up. Um, his teamsters had refused to go through under those conditions, and I don't blame them because I had a lot of truck trouble ducking the flying missiles, even from my vantage point across the street. Um, Edward Musa, um, who was a IATSE local member, also found the experience quite rugged. Um, there was a high pressure fire hose being used in tear gas, then goons with um, pieces of chain and black jacks. There were professional thugs paid each. It was a massacre that a big deputy sheriff walked away from the mass slugging and wept. This could only have been perpetrated by organized crime, I just thought. Um, and then 
the newspapers um, would later claim that um, communist manifesto pamphlets um, were being passed out at this Reddit, which would later be used as um, blackmail in order to pit the CSU as a communist organization, um, which would later come to greatly backfire against CSU and have public opinion uh, twisted against them. So um, at the moment, um, CSU um, won over public opinion overall um, with the pictures and um, the horrific um, stories that were coming out of um, that day on October 9th. Um, and days after it, um, similar events like these um, plagued Hollywood and um, uh, the LA Police Department um, essentially um, took note of these um, riots essentially in order to uh, take note of how to deal with future riots. And there's a, a film called Riot Control, which the police department filmed themselves and used that footage in order to study of how to break up picketers and also um, stop any public uprisings from happening in the area. Um, this, the CSU had a big win um, actually from this because they did win the jurisdiction over the set de decorators, which meant that they were able to control a very influential piece of um, the labor workforce in the studios, um, which were helping bring, uh, make the sets and whatnot. Um, but the one thing that still would later come to bite on the CSU in the back was that IATSE can still call jurisdictional disputes over the CSU, which would later essentially slow down the process um, and uh, basically keep them um, in legal fights that would prevent them from um, strategizing in order to effectively um, call on future strikes, which they would be forced to have to deal with. Um, and um, I want this piece of information. I know I've been talking a lot, um, but this piece of information um, was very um, shocking to me when I was reading it. Um, in 1946, um, the CSU briefly went on another strike against the studios who fired their affiliated machinists, carpenters, and preachers in protest. Um, but this time, there was enough IATSE people that didn't scab that actually um, gave a new contract to the CSU, which meant that they earned a 25% wage increase and a, get this, 36 hour work week with a guaranteed time and a half over time, any hour that they worked after that. Um, compared to the working conditions of Hollywood right now, um, where it's a minimum 60 hours a week, it's kind of crazy to think that um, Hollywood back in the day um, people were working around 40 hours um, a week with proper compensation, uh, reflecting uh, the profits that the studios were making and also um, putting in inflation. And then also during this time, the Treaty of Beverly Hills was signed, which was basically a peace treaty um, amongst um, the two film unions and studios, um, saying that all the disputes that were happening up until that point were basically squashed and um, was tried to use as a reset. But this piece did not last long because in film unions that were um, in other unions across the country, um, they were holding meetings and letting workforces know that management across multiple industries were developing a new strategy where they were going to force a lockout with impossible demands and widely publicize the lockout as a strike and then the bargain the film unions down to the lowest possible minimum and stall final settlement to serve out the union members and their families. Um, and this is exactly the strategy that the studios used with the CSU um, in September 1946. Um, but before everybody was locked out um, from the CSU and working on film sets, um, a very important decision um, from uh, a three arbitrator team from the AFL made saying that sec construction would be completely rewarded to IATSE in 1945, which meant that not only set decorators um, were given to IATSE, but also carpenters. 
And this was a huge loss um, to the film union because with the carpenters having full control be under IATSE, that meant that studios um, could build as many sets as possible and um, essentially keep um, the rate of production going up as um, it had been up until that point without any disruption. And during the original strike in 1945, um, there was actually um, talking about class consciousness and class solidarity amongst the studios, um, studio heads would go around and actually um, offer their own sets to other film studios in order to compensate for the fact that they didn't have the workforce in order to create enough sets. Um, uh, the, the film unions um, obviously uh, didn't do that because they were pitted up against one another. Um, and it's kind of crazy um, to think uh, that the studios were so easily collaborating with one another. Um, in general, less movies were being made um, at this point. Um, after the fall of, um, um, after the end of World War II, kind of um, more international um, embargoes on US films were being put on. And, um, and then actors um, like Ronald Reagan, um, he starts to become a huge player at this point of the history. Um, they were beginning to turn against the CSU uh, because they were getting tired of their uh, militant uh, trade attack, trade union tactics and resorting to violence in order to get uh, their means um, through uh, to management. Um, this development um, from the AFL um, was not accidental. Um, the CSU tried to reverse the AFL decision um, originally, which they did in August 1946, but um, the studios just simply um, ignored that decision from the AFL and they decided to um, only listen to the original decision and they um, took that as a legally binding agreement. Um, and with that, um, that um, um, basically set the stage for CSU to be locked out in September. Um, Roy Brewer um, at this point confessed that he had met with the studio executives um, and other actors at Hollywood um, at a hotel in Los Angeles. Um, they, decide, they discussed the suggestion that theaters and studios be closed down nationally. A plot was hatched to create hot sets that would presumably force carpenters, painters, and other workers to walk out. As it turned out, those who did not leave were asked to do so. At a congressional hearing in 1947, why Frank Freeman of Paramount was confronted with notes from these secret meetings, um, having denied the notes validity, but Freeman conceded their integrity as they were taken down by Victor Clark, an aide to Pat Casey, um, who was the chief negotiator of the studios at the time. Um, the guilt ridden Casey himself confessed to Father George Doan, an ally to the CSU, that he had leaked these notes, which showed clearly that the lockout had been deliberately promoted, manipulated by the producers, together with the IATSE leadership. Um, yeah, it wasn't really looking good for the CSU at this point, which leads to the demise of the film union. Um, newspapers um, such as the LA Times um, that uh, were not allied um, with the Communist Party um, and since that there was a lot of communist um, members like the Hollywood 10 um, or alleged um, communist members in Hollywood like the Hollywood 10, they started to uh, paint the CSU as communist in order to stoke fear and um, turn public opinion against the CSU. Um, but they didn't do that without a fight because IATSE Local 683, who, who processed and developed all the film stock for all of the film productions, um, actually refused to develop millions of feet of film stock in solidarity. But um, Roy Brewer, who was um, the vice president of um, Brown's leadership in IATSE, and who was appointed personally by Walsh um, himself, the current IATSE president at the time, um, was collaborating with organized crime and to basically have any 
dissenting opinions in IATSE um, essentially be arrested by the LA police. Um, and this was confirmed um, in reports that um, and pay stubs from um, studios like MGM that they had multiple police departments in the Los Angeles city on their payroll themselves in addition to their already um, funded police, um, uh, they're already funded um, tax paying um, salaries. Um, and then um, with the CSU kind of knowing that um, the end was near, um, it started to get even more ugly than Bloody Friday originally and things started to get a lot more violent. Um, and um, with this, um, especially with IATSE Local 683, um, there was reports of um, scabbers or people in IATSE having their homes bombed, essentially. And the newspapers tried to um, put the responsibility of that on the CSU. Um, Sorrell um, denied it um, originally, and um, it was the case that they were not responsible for the bombings, but um, the damage had already been done. And um, the public opinion had already been decided. Um, at this point, um, Reagan, um, prominent actor Gene Kelly and Sorrell um, organized a meeting amongst um, many representatives in the film unions and members of SAG, who at this point um, were claiming that their, um, their jobs and their roles were being um, threatened um, from the lack of fewer films being made. And also with um, more film productions being delayed and CSU um, turning to more violent tactics in order to stop film crews um, from actually even going on set. Um, actors um, didn't feel safe and they felt that their salaries were threatened and having to resort to other um, industries in order to make a living. So Reagan took this opportunity to show off his future political aspirations by um, stating that um, right here in this room for the first time is the one thing that the employers have feared most of Hollywood. Um, here is all of the labor shoulder to shoulder and side by side exactly the way it should be. Um, this meeting was more symbolic than not, um, knowing that the CSU was already on their way out, um, essentially. Um, and then with that, um, essentially, um, that was the end of um, progressive trade unionization. And uh, with that, um, um, any kind of hope for um, any democratic elected unions in order to um, fight essentially for better working conditions. Um, and I'm gonna stop it there actually, um, because I realized that I am at an hour and um, this part of the presentation is goes into a whole nother bit. Um, and <laughs> um, could you could you share that, Josh? Um, sh the um, the next part of the presentation. Yeah, I mean, if you have it available, I mean, I'd be interested to just read bullets. Certainly. Um. Yeah. Sure. So, um, essentially, what I wanted to do after this, um, after explaining the whole conflict, was that. Um, IATSE actually, um, in the name of um, um, of being anti-communist and trying to um, not stoke any um, communist influences being in the party, they actually um, made it so that the only person in IATSE that can authorize a strike authorization vote is the international president themselves. And um, so, in, as we saw in the 2021 contract negotiations, um, the popular vote actually voted to actually go forward with the strike. But Overwhelming. With the yeah. But with the co Electoral College um, vote that is instilled in IATSE, um, uh, the popular vote essentially was suppressed and it makes it a lot more harder and a lot more um, um, difficult for um, 
different locals within the IATSE in order to kind of like instill kind of any change in the industry. It's almost like it's designed to prevent a strike whatsoever. Yeah. Yes, very much so. <laughs> yep. Uh, Self neutering union. That's cool. <laughs> Well, thanks, Josh. This is very informative. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier, U.S. labor history uh, and U.S. film labor history is an extremely dense topic. Um, and I'm glad that uh, you uh, covered as much as you could uh, in this amount of time. Thanks. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Josh, we can have you back to finish. <laughs> Part two. Part two. Oh. Or part three, actually, it would be now. Yeah, sure. yeah, it is a part three. You know, they they do say that stories are always told in three parts. <laughs> <laughs> and and for the final, and act, except for Hollywood, because Hollywood tells stories in like thirty seven parts now. So you know, you just keep telling them. <laughs> it's true. Episodic, yeah. Yeah. Just franchise, yeah. There's there's another Harry Potter, you know, thing coming out here soon. So. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I liked how uh, I just uh, uh, saw um, uh, Spider-Man, um, the most recent one, No Way Home or whatever. And, and I, was, I was like, whatever. Um, but because uh, my kids want to see it. But I was amazed how they're like reconciling the, re the philosophy of the reboot within a multiverse concept. I'm like, this is genius. And they can bring back nostalgia actors. And it's so cool. Um, also awful. But um yeah, it's a uh, it's a uh, dense history. Maybe for the third act, though, we could have like that 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 little a uh, uh, a note of hope um, at the end, like what we can what we can do as as peons under the boot of capital. Um, yeah, because I mean, it is like I mentioned the statistic: six point one percent public or private union uh, membership rate in the United States now. Six point one percent. That's sad. Um, but things can change. Well, Josh, do you have any wrap up words for this? Um, yeah, essentially I just, um, again, kind of wanted to prove and show that like, um, that if there's going to be like any kind of change um in hollywood i don't think it's just gonna like take another like rally like in a city park um in order to change it there's gonna have to be a little more kind of um focused kind of um grassroots planning and um organizing in order to kind of talk about um or that too <laughs> or that too brad um there's gonna have to be um, a lot more um, done instead of just having um, Instagram posts and just little fun infographics that you can share on your Instagram story to give you the illusion that like you think that you're an activist um, because activism doesn't happen online. It happens in the real world where um, people have to meet in person and actions have to kind of be put into place. And um, one of those actions, which um, I was trying to get to at the end of the presentation was um, at the next um, quadrennial um, IATSE um, conference, um, if there's an organized front in order to get Matthew Loeb um, to be unseated as the president of IATSE, because ironically, if you trace the lineage of all of the IATSE presidents, um, all the way back, um, Matthew Loeb is actually does have a connection um, to the Brown administration of um, from 1934 um, to 1941. All of the presidents and all of the vice presidents have all a direct um, correlation and link to the Brown v. Auth administration of IATSE. Um, yeah, it's it's really something that is not um, widely kind of talked about and I tried in part three I'm going to try to make it more engaging and um, 
interesting less, less disheartening but yeah <laughs> yeah yeah no less fo- photos of people um protesting and more kind of um ways of to get um uh grassroots stuff kind of getting up and down I think what you mentioned, though, earlier about uh, the propaganda machine of Hollywood um, in forming this anti-labor opinion uh, to popularize that when the United States has been very pro-labor through the early 20th century, um, Hollywood really did a big part in reversing that. Um, And so social media and the narrative uh, can do a big part and is doing a big part in winning over minds and hearts. And I think that's the first step um, and action flows from um, changing people's minds. Um, so I, th- I think there is value in that certainly, but it's not just that. Oh yeah, like it, it, not to discredit um, my Hayati stories. I think what they did, um, if it wasn't for Hayati stories, we wouldn't even kind of be having this conversation in the first place. And that's why I kind of wanted to um, touch upon the fact that a lot of people were kind of attacking them um when like there is that one kind of rogue admin that was saying to vote yes for the strike um for the um ratification of the contract um, i remember there was a lot of people and um, there was a big kind of controversy that was happening amongst other followers on IATSE stories where people were trying to claim that they were um um that they were gotten to um from somebody from IFC or like the studios um and it's the same kind of thing that I have seen CSU kind of got embroiled in um, in the 1940s. And the studios knew exactly what they were doing by just letting that foster and to just kind of have this bickering and this kind of um, culture of, of um, trying to come out on top and divide and conquer, essentially. Um, I whenever it kind of like, I, it, that's exactly what happened with my IATSE stories. And I think that building upon that foundation that those IATSE and former IATSE members very graciously did and sacrificed a lot of mental health and um, a lot of stress on top of their already like um, um, workload, essentially. I think that it's time to um, look to 2024 and thinking about having some real substantial changes, considering the fact that all these streaming services are essentially, it's just a vertical integrated model all over again. Um, All these studios are reaping 100% of the profits and it's just the 1930s and 1940s all over again. When did you say the current contract goes to? Um, 2024 is when the next round of negotiations, I believe starts, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it's every three years. So I'm currently two years out of a contract though and don't have a new one. So the team, what? Mm. Mm-hmm. Teamsters haven't been able to get anything for like two years. Well, I mean, there was a COVID extension for a year, but even that were, I mean, I think July was our was when we were supposed to have a new contract in place and they're they're as of now they're i believe currently negotiating it or in talks at this point but we're already behind or already past our cutoff date oh wow that's crazy i know that um from um talking with like like people like jake and um chris like they were like talking about it like at the same time i just thought that the teamsters contract was always in tandem with the um, the basic agreement. Um, I mean, they, they always go in like a cycle. So I like, I forget what the exact order is, but I think it's like writers go first, then there's the director's guild and then it's IATSE and then it's Teamsters, like, and then and there's sort of some other things in there too, but like, they always kind of go in the same order. So typically the, you know, whatever rates get set with writers like tend to trickle down and historically, I believe have like sort of been used as a tent pole for everything else. Um, you know, that didn't happen with the IATSE contract as much um, this time around, but, um, you know, it remains to be seen, like, what, you know, what the lower end people in my union are going to get as a raise. Mm. You know, they're, they're making barely over minimum wage at this point, so. Yeah, it's crazy to know that, like, a location assistant who does 
so much more than like what a unit PA um, does, which is like the entry level um, position in the locations department is like what only like a two dollar and fifty cent like increase per hour in some instances. I mean, it's I think it's well I don't know what the rate is, but I think it's seventeen seventy nine or eighty nine or something. So I mean, not much more than fifteen. I mean, the the perk on that is you get, you know, you get um, pension. You get healthcare. You get other other stuff added on to that. Like we get uh, car rental if you have a car. Like they'll pay for they'll pay you for your car instead of renting you one. They'll give you a kit rental for your like supplies. But effectively, that stuff just negates your overtime percentages. So like, yeah, if those rates were built into your compensation, like you could your overtime rate would end up getting being higher. You know, if you're doing overtime, whereas now like your overtime is basically based on minimum wage as opposed to whatever, you know, whatever the prorated amount would be with all that stuff added on. Yeah. You know, which is like a hundred dollars a day off of your base rate that doesn't get factored in no overtime off that, which is a big thing over a year. Yeah. I mean, like as in the, the July 1946 CSU contract negotiations, they were originally able to like have like the same essentially rate of pay, but only working for 36 hours a week. Like it's, I like that, like that's also like a huge reason why, like I wanted to highlight the the history of like Bloody Friday and the war for one of others, because it just um, made me kind of like frustrated to think that like, the industry was this, um, like there's like a much more work-life balance compared to like what we kind of are facing with. Cause like- you, last- said it, you said it was 36 hour work week with time and a half after that. I mean, like, like I have a 60 hour guaranteed week with like, I have time and a half every day after eight hours or after 40 hours, you know, in a week, like everything is still time and a half. Like, were they actually working those shorter hours or was it like that was just their their base pay was based off that do you know that answer they from the research um from the the book class struggle um that i highlighted um it it, the the author insinuated that that was the amount of hours that they were working per week Mm -hmm. um before that contract um they were only working um eight hours a day six days a week which was granted 48 hours a week but it's a lot better than a 60 hour guarantee and also if they were to work eight hours and on average most of the um, crafts within the csu they were only working six hours a day six days a week so um on top of and like and if they were to work eight hours built into their already negotiated contracts with the studios um they would get paid automatically for nine hours um so this was before time and a half was invented but the max amount of work that you could work in one day at that time was eight hours and if you worked that eighth hour completely you would get paid for nine so you essentially were getting paid an hour free every day that you worked eight hours um it's um it's it's insane to think and I know there is um, a separate um, Instagram account um, that was talking um, about polls about uh, what they were talking about and what they agreed with and what they didn't agree with the 2021 contract negotiations. One thing that struck out to me is that the least favored work day schedule that was voted upon was the eight hour work day. Everybody thought that the only thing that we could work for was only 10. Like the idea, like we have been so worked to the bone and like we have been so, it's been so ingrained into the culture and just in general in the union and non-union worlds in production and post-production that you have to work a 12 hour day or else you're not productive enough. Like there's always time, there's always more time to just get as much work done as possible but we forget to think that if we don't have a balance of like being with our our families if we don't have a social life on top of that like we're not as productive we're just as productive when we have the rest working 40 hours a week sometimes working only four days a week we're even more productive when we're working these insane 60 hour day 60 hour a week work weeks for like four to five months at a time. Do um, you think that um, part of the reason that they they were reluctant to do like 
in eight hour days because like the wages haven't increased like like um in correlation with like inflation and other t- like cost of living and stuff so it's like at this point like if you worked that eight hour day consistently then like you wouldn't even make like enough money in some circumstances so it's like you almost like are forced into a position where you have to work more because the wages haven't increased with you know other factors i mean the fact the Instagram account that I'm talking about, um, they were only able to get, I think, like a uh, thousand or fifteen hundred um, members out of a sixty thousand member organization. Um, so the polls and the statistics um, were not entirely um, uh, statistically sound. Um, if like I'm speaking on that part, but one thing that I in- could insinuate um, from the survey is that there's a fear that if we only work eight hours, um, you only get paid for eight hours. And a big reason why that wage increase um, from the July 1946 contract was so huge is because they were getting paid the same amount they were getting paid as compared to working a 48 hour week, but they were getting paid, they were only working 36 hours a week. So they were paid just the same amount, essentially, for working less hours. Um, and I feel like people kind of miss that correlation sometimes. And like when you have like 36 hours of work, essentially, like you are able to... Um... Okay, good night, Nick. Good night, um, Jack. Thank you for hearing me ramble and rant about um, labor organization. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, th- I mean, to answer your, your question, Jacob, that's pretty much um, why I think, I don't know for sure is actually because I don't, wasn't running the survey. And also the survey was very um, underground and not um, sound. Yeah, it just seems like a convenient way of forcing people to work more and not even like, like the the choice to work less is basically a choice to like, you know, not have enough money to live. And that's kind of almost even more um, convincing than just like, you know, telling people they have to just, you know, it's like increase, like not having, I mean, if you look at wages and, you know, like CEO wages versus like worker, I mean, like, it's just like crazy. So that is like probably a huge yeah imagine as well yeah and especially in the 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 90s was specifically when like we kind of like reached this point of no return um in in general um specifically with all kind of industries um where reaganomics um kind of took full effect where you you cut down taxes you you cut down um, the wealth tax, um, which in this country, it used to be 90% after like every, 90% of every dollar made after like $10 million, I want to say. Um, and like, that was the big reason why there was like a bunch of public funding at the times because the government had the money because they were appropriately taxing um, everybody at that time based on the amount of income that they were making at no fault of their own. Um, so it's, there's still like, and not only is there like an educational aspect to it, but I also think it's also kind of a psychological thing that people need to be a little bit more made aware of in order to, um, talk about, um, labor organization and labor movements in general, because I feel like, especially with COVID on top of already the mental illness that we've been all experiencing because of the lack of socialization that we've had, um, that we didn't have um, during this time period. And we kind of like are forced to go back in society acting like nothing has happened. Um, we need to kind of, there, in terms of building solidarity amongst the working middle class, there needs to be an understanding of just like, no, like it is possible for us to be asking for these demands because if we all collectively say it together, the people like the AMPTP, are gonna have no other choice but to agree to the demands. Um, and like they use the infighting and the bickering to their advantage. And it has been happening ever since the 1940s. 
Speaking of that, like psychological aspect, sorry to butt in again, but like, I know, oh, go ahead. Like, I, I know um, a lot of people, when you talk to them about um, kind of labor organization and the rights of workers, there's a lot of people who have this attitude, even in Hollywood towards like film workers and theater workers and all this stuff that it's kind of this like privileged job. And that's something I didn't recognize was like such a thing with people. But talking to someone who's been in the industry for a while, he's like, well, you know, if you don't like these working conditions, you could work at, you know, McDonald's and do something that is more, you know, like, I don't know, like, it just like, just the, the idea that working in the film industry is some kind of like, you're, you just are supposed to expect that kind of working condition. That's like been ingrained into a lot of people's minds too, that this is just like, that's what it is and get another job if you don't like it and that's a huge thing people say all the time is you don't like your job you just get another job it's not thinking, you know it's like existentially about what is like a job and what does a job you know what is a job supposed to be it's just like well this job is this and that job is that. it's i mean like lack of solidarity and class consciousness just like you were saying yeah and like yeah, it was exactly what kind of like Oliver put in the group chat was like, we've all kind of been told this lie that like, if you work hard enough, like you're gonna make it. It's kind of like that American dream um, kind of thing. And like COVID kind of really disillusioned a lot of people to that idea of where it's just like, well, if you're just constantly like burying yourself in work, then like you're gonna be able to kind of like lose like the true meaning in life which is like the people that you surround yourself with and like the relationships that you're able to like maintain and um it's it's something that is so complex that a 24 year old um is not going to be able to give any solutions to um <laughs> in many <laughs> um there's um and like it's been a question that generations have tried to answer um, from time and time again and there has not been one singular answer that has been proven to be the one um so it's um but with the again with the advent of this technology that is all now imposed to us um it gives us this power in order to um talk openly about these ideas and kind of to challenge each other and to push each other into thinking like what is what is like utopia like if it were achievable and then you like start building off from that like top top of the barrel like demands and then you can create change that way essentially power utopia is like a huge um Thing that could be like really very powerful um, and whatnot. Narrative. That's important. I, uh, I have a question that I wager you don't have an answer for, and <laughs> I think it's still productive to ask. But um, right now, my day job is I work at, um, not literally for Amazon, I work for a co company that contracts for Amazon. So basically, I'm a delivery driver or delivery walker, I right? push a cart. Uh, not proud, but that was the best job I could get uh, here in the city. And you got to start somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Um, and hopefully I'll be transitioning soon. But the reason I bring it up is because like it was really just a chance to talk. Um, I've really had the chance to just talk to a bunch of working class people, a lot of them single parents who are not much older than I am, who are doing this in combination with like another job in the evening and then like getting four hours of sleep and doing the whole thing over again for like seven days straight. And basically like when I start to have conversations about whether it's unionization or even just what the people upstairs are doing to screw them over, they're usually on board that they're being screwed over, but like their mind usually doesn't go to class consciousness. It goes to like some sort of escape route, like some sort of entrepreneurial, like endeavor that can be pursued it goes to like bitcoin it goes to NFT, selling nfts and there's just like and especially in new york you see it everywhere like nfts at least for the moment are this like thing that i think will ultimately be a fad but it is kind of i think comes from this like want to just escape your situation and 
I guess really what my question comes to is like, Americans are so housebroken. Like, how do you like sort of get them reinvigorated with collective movements and unions, especially seeing how it's in our history when basically ever since uh, Reagan, ever since the Red Scare, ever since the 1920s Red Scare, like it's just been drilled out of us. You are right. There is no one answer. <laughs> um, but I mean, but like, I mean, one thing that I kind of, can comment on is that um, when you're talking about like NFTs and cryptocurrency and whatnot, um, originally the idea of cryptocurrency is actually a very anarchist ideological idea. The idea was that, I forget the guy who invented the idea of cryptocurrency who created the first manifesto of it, um, but it was actually used, um, it was invented to basically um, create um, an independence of, of governance, essentially, is that you can have the working class um, people and just people in general be able to have commerce without a, a governing body telling them that like it's worth something. And then from that independence of a governance, you can strive to work on social change and other stuff and the the words like in a um yeah and anarch, anarch anarcho capitalism lame exactly <laughs> um like it's i like and that like that's the thing that um capitalism is so good at um i think one book that i think that you should kind of like read is this book called capitalist realism is there no alternative by mark fisher um he answers the question of um we are seemingly kind of like trapped in like this um motive like this, this cycle essentially um that uh we there's like the, the change is impossible um that we don't have any agency anymore in terms of creating anything that's actually um worth not worth it. there's 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 no really kind of like way to kind of like get out of the situation that we've currently found ourselves in and the one thing that um i really found in enlightening and inspiring about that novel was um, that it really highlighted the fact that, like how good our system is at co-opting um, ideas that are inherently in the um, in the interest of like working class and middle class people um, that the idea that like businessmen like these finance bros um can just like come in and like raise the price of like dogecoin like elon musk like can just like go on snl promote dogecoin and have it crash the next day because everybody found him so insanely unfunny <laughs> um so it's it's kind of crazy um that it, but like getting to the point of like um co-opting um ideas is that it's so good that capitalism is so good at thinking that it can just turn everything to its advantage and create a um a profit motive out of it and commodify it essentially um is that um that like at least acknowledging that idea in and of itself is revolutionary because it acknowledges that the system that we're currently in does exist and it also kind of invites conversation like this in order to prove like well like what is the alternative i'm just yeah curious. that's great oh, oh sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I, was, I was just saying yeah that that's great i'll definitely check out uh, capitalist realism um because i think the other thing like i would love to do in conversation uh is just find a way to synthesize theory into something that uh, can be sort of universally understood because there is definitely like a huge barrier to, you know, um, common, common parlance and uh, theory. Yeah. And to, to pinpoint and to jump off Oliver's comment um, is the right wing is not the only problem. Um, 
I really hope that um, I didn't want to paint the CSU um, union um, in Hollywood as like this like gold standard of like what the union was is that um, because the CSU failed for a very specific reason. And that's very specific reason is that um, they were kind of racist um, <laughs> in like any kind of like um, of like leftist progressives um, at that time, their biggest failure was not um, creating a class consciousness and a class solidarity amongst all races in America, specifically with black people, Asian people, um, Hispanic people, et cetera, et cetera. The CSU's um, demographic was overwhelmingly white and um, they were prone to engaging in homophobic rhetoric, anti-Semitism, racism. Um, Herb um, Solar um, in the 1920s was known to attend KKK rallies and KKK meetings. And that was a huge reason why they weren't able to build any kind of successful model because not only because of Herbert's um, prejudices and basically like um, the American left's mm. prejudices at the time, um, but just in general, Her Sorwell was actually a horrible tactician um, in general. Um, he really didn't know how to um, create allies and keep them. Um, <laughs> so, um, and that's something I also didn't really have time to kind of talk about in the presentation because it's just again just dense and big topic man big never topic. enough time for this no this is very uh very stimulating conversation though thank you again josh i gotta uh, head out but it's been wonderful thanks all yeah no problem <laughs>